How's it going, everybody, this evening? Welcome back to another edition of some learning videos, uh, especially about my favorite subject, Lincoln Sense. My name is Blaine Newpert. I have been doing this and coin collecting now for a little over 35 years. And of those 35 years, almost 30 of them have been involved with collecting uncirculated rolls, specifically speaking, uncirculated rolls of Lincoln Sense. Um, the coin that has fascinated so many generations for literally 115 years, uh, and it is by far one of the, the denominations that I am the most passionate about. And today, I am going to have the joy of explaining to you guys a little bit about a very, very special role. This is a role of 1943 Philadelphia Mint Steel Sense. So it's an original bank wrapped roll still in its wrapper from the bank where it originated. The cool part about this roll isn't so much the fact that it contains 50 1943 steel cents. Don't. It's actually more along the lines of the fact of where this particular roll came from, what bank it came from. And that's the part that I am going to tell the story of because the history behind the bank is without a doubt, probably one of the coolest stories that I have ever run across. Now, just so you're aware, I've been aware of this bank for a long time. Uh, I have hunted roles of this particular bank for probably close to 10 years now. And as a result, every time I find one, I love to buy it and hold on to it. I have numerous amounts of rolls that are actually unopened from this particular bank. Uh, and I enjoy holding on to those rolls in their unopened form. I have also opened a bunch of them as well, and I will do that with this particular role. So welcome aboard. Hopefully you guys are going to enjoy this and I am really looking forward to telling you this story. I'm going to take you on a history tour here of the city of Philadelphia for a little bit. And everybody is aware of Philadelphia, where it's located, all of that. That's perfectly fine. But the interesting part about it is back in the year 1828, the city of Philadelphia was actually a very, very small city. And it had a bunch of townships that surrounded it. And one of those sh townships, excuse me, was the township of Penn, P-E-N-N. -N. So this township had some people in it, some gentlemen in it that decided they wanted to start a bank. So they started a bank on July 14th, 1828 of what's called the Central Penn Township Bank. So that bank was actually right on the borders of the city of Philadelphia and the township of Penn. That was kind of how they did it. And that bank was exceptionally well known for being very good at uh, seeing the downturns in the economy, seeing things that were happening and still being a profitable bank. As a matter of fact, it was one of the very few banks on the East Coast that continued to be profitable all the way up and through the Civil War. So in 1864, the bank actually wound up going national. So as this bank decided it wanted to go national, it needed bigger space and more space. So it started looking for property and the property that it settled on was the property at 700 Market Street. 700 Market Street was right on the southwest corner of, uh, of 7th and Market in uh, Philadelphia. And that particular building that stood in its location was actually a historically significant building. It was the building, uh, the building that was on that property was the Graf House. Now, if you know anything about history, if you remember your history from school, the Graf House was where Jefferson actually penned the Declaration of Independence. So it was a historically significant building. This bank came in 
purchased the property, the property itself, the house itself was actually in quite bad disrepair. So the building, uh, the Graf house was torn down and a brand new building was put in its place for this particular bank. That's the picture you see on your screen right now is the bank. The picture that was right before it was the Graf house. Now, interestingly enough, that picture that you see of the Graf house or that you did see of the Graf house, I'll put it back up here so you can see it. There you go. That particular uh, Graf house was is the rebuilt version of the Graf house when it was rebuilt in 1975. Uh, and they did it that way so that they could obviously have the historical significance of where Jefferson penned the Declaration of Independence. Okay, so the bank purchased the property. And uh, in February of 1883, the Graf House was demolished and this particular bank, new bank, was put up in its place. And this particular bank was such a success in terms of its uh, design that the citizens of Pennsylvania went absolutely crazy for it. They absolutely loved it. They thought it was extremely well done. Uh, and as a result, the bank continued to prosper and grow. Uh, and, and even through some of the economic downturns of the early uh, 20th century and stuff like that, those particular uh, downturns were still uh, ridden out very well by this particular bank. They were very good at what they have done since 1828. So here we are in the early 1900s. And as we approach uh, the Great Depression, the bank is still doing very well. And up until the Great Depression, they were doing just fine. When they actually wound up getting into the Great Depression, they had to merge with another bank and, and the bank name changed slightly. It was the Central Penn uh, National Bank of Philadelphia is what wound up becoming. So the bank itself actually wound up uh, moving out of the building in the mid 1930s and um, creating several different um, branches, I guess, if you want to call it such, all of which were scattered in and amongst the Philadelphia area and all of which were within a very, very stone's throw of the Philadelphia Mint. So now you know why I hunt this particular bank wrapped roll. These rolls, if you stop and think about it, these rolls actually traveled a very short distance from the, the uh, Philadelphia Mint to the Treasury and then from the Treasury to these banks in um, the Philadelphia area. And as a result, they really didn't get jostled around much. They really didn't get um, moved around much. And so the likelihood of coins in these particular roles being of absolutely perfect quality is significantly greater than that of roles from banks further away from the Treasury Department in Philadelphia. So now you know a little bit about that. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about this roll so that you guys can get an opportunity to see it. And then I'm going to open it on film for you so you can see what's inside. So as you see on the screen in front of you, this is the end of the 1943 roll that I currently have uh, that I'm going to open on the next video, just so that you guys, I uh, don't make this one too long uh, to watch, but um, you can take a really good look at this particular end of the roll, and I want to make sure that I point out a couple of things. I've put a couple of blue arrows on it, as you can see, uh, up in the 10 o'clock or so uh, location on this particular uh, end coin. And the this particular wrapper that's around this roll is actually what's known as a Batdorf wrapper. So if you've watched some of my previous videos, you know what a Batdorf wrapper is. It's a very uh, unique wrapper that goes around rolls. Uh, it's extremely tight around coins uh, and it uh, tends to preserve the coins exceptionally well. So this particular bank not only has a really cool historical significance to it, but it also has uh, and used the Batdorf wrapping machine to wrap its coins with. So this is why I hunt this particular bank, uh, because of the quality of the coins and the history behind the bank. 
So those particular blue arrows that you see up there, those actually show the scratches that the machine makes. And uh, there's a lot of people that give them funny names. Some people call them the uh, the ring of death, uh, you know, for the end coins and stuff like that, because uh, with this particular wrapping machine, it, it wrapped coins so incredibly tightly that it tended to wind up scratching the end coins on both ends of the rolls uh, mm -hmm. when it was made. So now the other interesting part about the end of this particular roll uh, that you'll notice is that, like I said, this is wrapped exceptionally tight. You cannot shake these coins at all. They will not move. They don't uh, um, slide around within the roll itself. And uh, you'll get a chance to see that in the next video. But I wanted to make sure that I at least also pointed out the fact that this is what the end of a roll of coins should look like from almost 80 years ago. It should not be spotless. It should not be perfect. It should have some flaws to it. It should have some carbon spots to it. It should have some show and uh, sign of wear uh, in terms of just oxidation uh, in the general air. So stay tuned, if you will, for the next uh, I guess video, I will try and do that within the next day or so, so that I can open this on film for you guys. I wanna make sure that I do it right. But now you know the history behind this particular bank. Thanks for watching everybody. Hopefully you've learned something. Have a good evening.